All right, so Grutzi Mitanand, yet again, uh, thank you all for coming. And um, yeah, we have a lot to get through today. So um, let's get right into it. Um, let's uh, just start with a little abbreviated um, meditation here at the beginning to sort of settle our minds and uh, then we'll uh, readjust our motivation. <clears throat> so uh, as we normally do, please get into a comfortable meditation posture. So again, most important thing is to uh, sit upright. So we, we spend the first uh, few moments uh, just trying to get our awareness uh, back into our body. So focusing on the, the fact that we're now sitting. And sort of mentally telling ourselves that now we're uh, going to meditate. So bringing our awareness to the to the body and to the sensations help us to bring our awareness to the present moment. And then we do a quick scan from head to toe, trying to identify any spots where there are tensions or, uh, you know, we could, could be holding some, uh, our muscles clenched a bit. So we just relax. And then continuing our awareness to now the breath. So the first few breaths take a little bit uh, more deep and intentional. So try to really fill the lungs completely with air. Feel the expansion. And then when you exhale, just do it effortlessly. So the air just comes out and try to expel all the air, the stagnant air in your lungs. And we do that three times. Exhaling again. And one more time. And continue on with the, just the natural flow of the breath. Here, not trying to control it, just letting the breath itself breathe on its own. Yet at the same time, we just focus on the sensations, the tactile sensations as we breathe in and out. So wherever they manifest, be it the rising and falling of the abdomen, the chest expanding or contracting, or even the area in the nostrils, feeling the air go over the skin, wherever is manifesting for you, just remain focused there. And when other appearances occur, don't follow after them. We can use every exhalation as a natural opportunity to let go as we let go of the breath. And every inhalation as an opportunity to firm up our awareness on the object of meditation.
So we'll do this for a few more minutes. Okay, so gently come out of the meditation. All right, so, um, before we begin, uh, remember the most important thing, adjusting our motivation. So please think that the purpose of my life is to benefit all sinning beings. And in particular, in order that I may, I may be able to free all sinning beings from the oceans of samsaric suffering and lead them to the highest state of enlightenment. I myself must first uh, do that. And therefore I need to learn about all the various uh, practices that lead to enlightenment so I can put them into practice myself. And uh, therefore I'm going to engage in this uh, lecture uh, here this evening. All right. So, um, yeah, last time uh, we went through the uh, 12 links and then we just started uh, through this uh, abbreviated classification of the various factors. But um, yeah, maybe we can just review a little bit. Uh, once we know what the 12 factors are, then um, these other ways of classifying it can become uh, quite, quite clear. Um, and if we don't really know what's going on with the 12 factors, then uh, trying to classify them becomes very difficult. 
So um, let's just go through that uh, quickly. And even what I wanted to say is this, this order that is presented here um, in, in this order of the 12 links, um, there are other ways of presenting the order because um, as, as we know, right, cyclic existence, it's, a, it's like a circle. So, you know, where does a circle begin, right? Um, you can't really say. Um, it could begin anywhere. So um, these uh, presentations of even the order, uh, there's a few different ones. So um, let's do the, the traditional order as is, is known here, right? So first, we have the, the ignorance, which we had said, um, although there's a few different views here, it's the ignorance that grasps to the, uh, the view of the perishing aggregates. So, um, well, basically, that is, uh, according to the Prasangika Majamika system, that is a grasping to yourself as being uh, inherently and intrinsically existent. Okay, so then through the power of that uh, ignorance, right, um, we then accumulate uh, karma, or uh, how do they translate it here? Hmm. Something action. Oh, compositional activity. Okay, so um, here this uh, compositional activity or karma uh, can be either virtuous or non-virtuous, okay? So in, in both cases, we have this sense of, you know, the, the self, the I, and then um, we could, for example, even do virtuous action. Uh, maybe we've uh, heard about karma, maybe we, maybe we believe in it a little bit, and then we think, okay, uh, I wanna get a good rebirth in my next life. Uh, therefore, I'm going to engage in this action of generosity, right? But there still is this, this, um, this kind of stain of thinking, uh, I, you know, this in inherently existent I, uh, I want to experience something good in my next life. Um, but that thought to experience something good in your next life uh, as if we compare it with the, um, the three levels of the motivation in Lam Rim, that is sufficient for something to be in the, the so-called uh, small uh, capable being or the uh, initial uh, person of initial capacity. So with that thought that I want to uh, experience something good in my next life, then to engage in an act of generosity does qualify as virtue, but since it's stained with the uh, thought of the inherent existent I, then uh, it still is a cause for rebirth within samsara, okay? So sometimes uh, you'll, you'll see uh, contaminated karma, right? Um, so what is contaminating our karma is this uh, grasping to the uh, inherent existence of the self, okay? So um, yeah, Remember, we were saying that in general, samsara is this process of uncontrolled rebirth due to karma and afflictions, okay? So um, to be a bit more precise, uh, you could say uh, the process of uncontrolled rebirth due to contaminated karma and afflictions. Uh, but you see, even by saying uh, uncontrolled you know, rebirth, that is good enough for a sort of um, uh, layman's um, definition of karma. Because actually, if we say it's uncontrolled re rebirth, uh, well, the only people, so the only karma they have actually is uh, contaminated, okay? But, uh, if you want to be a bit more precise, you can add that word in contaminated karma. Okay. All right. So third uh, is the, the link of uh, consciousness. And so um, in the Lamrim presentation, 
they then divide the, the consciousness at the time. Uh, how do they translate it, right? Uh, consciousness of the causal period and consciousness of the effect period, okay? Um, but later, when you um, uh, study, for example, the um, Abhisamaya Alamkara by uh, Maitreya, uh, they're actually, they don't have this uh, split of the consciousness into the, the causal period and the effect period. Uh, they just have the uh, consciousness as the, at the causal period, okay? So um, what that means is then this uh, karma needs to then be uh, deposited, okay? Um, so the thought is like this, right? Uh, remember our act of generosity, okay? So we have this motivation to be generous, okay? And to give something to someone else. <clears throat> but between that time and the time we experience uh, getting the, the wealth or the resources, well, uh, that, uh, that mind, that intention to be generous uh, isn't always there. And, you know, many, many, many lifetimes and many, many eons could go by between the time we had a generous thought and the time we uh, experienced the fruition of that action. Okay. So uh, how then is that linked? Well, there is this thought then that um, this uh, karmic kind of imprint is uh, somehow deposited uh, on to, well, and then how that work? Um, it can't be a deposit within our, our own body because this body uh, totally ceases at the time of death. So the only thing that sort of continues on life to life is uh, the consciousness. And so um, the, the various Buddhist schools uh, had uh, sort of different uh, theories about, well, what actually continues. The, the standard view uh, is that there are six consciousnesses and the, the five sort of sense consciousnesses uh, don't uh, go on life to life. Uh, and we know that because, for example, uh, we would take re rebirth in the formless realms. And remember, in the formless realms, the five sense consciousnesses aren't there. There's no form and, uh, and also no sounds and no tastes, uh, you know. And so uh, the only thing that then is remaining is the uh, mental consciousness. Okay. Now, uh, hmm. Without getting into this too much, I think in here even it was saying that, uh, yeah, right. In the sutras, Buddha speaks of the six types of consciousnesses. Nonetheless, here the principal consciousness is the fundamental consciousness according to those who is. So uh, here, um, without getting into it too much, there is the, the mind-only school, and within the mind-only school, there's uh, two branches, and uh, one of them asserts eight types of consciousness, okay? Because uh, at certain uh, times, okay, when we faint, for example, they say that the, the mental consciousness then uh, no longer exists momentarily, okay? So in those times when the the, the five sense consciousnesses, as well as the mental consciousness uh, would not exist, um, then, well, would the person then cease to exist? Hmm? Uh, they say no. But uh, the reason for that is they then posit two extra uh, types of consciousness that although the first six aren't operating, aren't uh, actually, they don't exist at that time, well, there is this fundamental consciousness that um, does exist. And that exists sort of all the time, okay? Even in times of uh, fainting and, you know, swooning, right? Uh, and then the seventh consciousness is uh, what they call the afflicted consciousness. And that observes, for, for us samsaric beings, that observes the eighth consciousness 
and holds that to be the, the self, the I. Okay, I'm being a bit uh, rough, but uh, that question had come up, and so I'm answering it uh, ahead of time. Okay, anyway, uh, for the mind only school that asserts this uh, eighth consciousness, that is where these karmic imprints are stored. Okay. And then for the ones who don't assert it, then it is the, the sixth consciousness, the uh, mental consciousness that uh, stores these karmic imprints. Okay. All right. Um, hmm. All right. So now we have um, the fourth in, in this list is name and form. Okay. So, mm, hmm. Okay. Alexander had a question last time because I had said that uh, name and form is, is simultaneous with uh, birth, right? And then there was a, a sort of question, how, how can that be? Um, you know, we're in, in one sense, we're presenting these in, in a sort of sequence. And then uh, on the other hand, we say that, you know, number four and number 11 are simultaneous. Okay. So uh, first, uh, remember what name and form is. It is uh, when the uh, consciousness enters the ovum. Okay. We're talking in, in, in the case of a uh, birth in the womb when the consciousness from a previous life enters the fertilized egg, okay? Then we have, uh, you know, there's the five aggregates and then, you know, form aggregate. Yes, that's form. And name refers to the uh, other uh, four aggregates. And um, the, the reason why they call that name, um, well, I looked in the text and it wasn't extremely satisfying to me, but so form, right, is the, the object, uh, direct object of our sense consciousness, okay? But these other four aggregates, they're not, right? So it's either consciousness or compositional factors, which don't appear to the uh, sense consciousness, right? So then the, uh, this commentary was saying, because then to posit them, we have to use conceptuality, right? Because uh, they're not appearing to the five sense consciousnesses, right? So conceptuality is another way of saying name, okay? Now, of course, when you look in the Prasangika school, uh, many of you know that, well, actually everything is merely uh, posited or merely designated by conceptuality. But this presentation, of the 12 links actually is, is in, in common with all of the uh, four Buddhist tenet systems. And so for other ones, uh, you know, they, they don't say that, uh, for example, form, uh, other schools say that's not posited by conceptuality. You understand? Right? Okay. Anyway, uh, that's what they say. So uh, anyway, whatever you want to call it, the point is that name and form it is when these uh, sort of uh, the mind uh, enters the fertilized egg, okay? Then, uh, okay, getting back to Alexander's sort of uh, qualm, uh, it was only the, the next day when I totally understood uh, sort of the, the upshot of his question. Okay, um, and actually, I'm not sure even now, but what I thought was kind of like this. All right, let me give you an example, okay? So, um, all right, hear me out. Everyone who is a father, okay, is necessarily a son, okay, S-O-N. Okay, you think about that. Everyone who is a father is necessarily a son. Okay, but 
your father is necessarily not your son. Okay? You understand? Uh, uh, you can do this. Yes, I understand. Okay? Right? You understand? So, um, right? You'll see this also, right, in, in the, the text that every compounded phenomena the sprout and the fully grown tree, right? Okay. I mean, do it, right? Seed, sprout, the sprout grows into a tree. That tree will create more seeds, which will then create more sprouts, right? So, you know, it continues on and on, okay? So, mm, on the one hand, when we say that uh, birth, sorry, a birth is simultaneous with name and form, okay? So uh, every time there's a, a, a birth, what does that mean? The, the consciousness entering the embryo or the, the, the zygote or the fertilized egg, right? Um, so that is always simultaneous with name and form, okay? So now when we see there's this order and then, okay, Number four is name and form, and then number uh, 11 is birth, okay? They're talking about sort of two uh, kind of cycles, right? Where um, this will become clear, hopefully, when we talk about how many lifetimes it takes. But you see, the, uh, the birth, that is the effect Okay, that, that, so if something is the effect of something else, it means it's coming afterwards, right? So the birth that is the effect of this name and form is not simultaneous with it, okay? Do you understand? But there is, uh, okay, at the same time of the name and form, there is a birth that's simultaneous with it, okay? But those aren't cause and effect because they're simultaneous, okay? But we have, on the other hand, a, a notion of, uh, you know, the, the, this unending cycle. So in one sort of cycle, you know, you'll have a, a birth uh, that will be a cause uh, of a name and form in the future. You'll also have a name and form that's uh, a cause of a, a birth in the future, okay? Those aren't simultaneous. But in general, name and form and birth are simultaneous. Okay? Sorry, I tried to make it more clear and maybe I caused more confusion. Just think of that with the father and son, okay? Everyone who is a father is necessarily a son. But if someone is, uh, you know, your father, they're necessarily not your son. Okay, I think that helps. I hope so. Okay? All right. So now, uh, six sources we have. Uh, here's the development in the womb where the, just that fertilized egg divides, divides, divides. At a certain point, you know, the, the, the physical kind of sense consciousness, the, the, the basis for that, the eyes, the, the, the tongue, the nose, so forth, those develop, okay? That's what that means, six sources. Then uh, contact. Now that you have the, the, the sort of um, embryo has the, the fully developed sense consciousnesses, then they, they can come into contact with uh, sights, with smells and so forth, okay? And that, uh, that's what contact means. The, the, the three things coming together, you have the, the external, let's say the, the form, you have the eye sort of sense power, which is located within the eye, and then uh, the, the eye consciousness. 
So those three things coming together, you'll have the um, uh, awareness of the object that you can then can uh, distinguish between attractive, unattractive, and neutral. Okay. Now, now next feeling uh, when those come together, yeah. Generally, when you have an attractive object, then you feel uh, something pleasant, right? Uh, an unattractive object will uh, cause a painful uh, sort of feeling, and then uh, neutral. Okay. All right. Then uh, there's craving. So here it's important to note that uh, although in general um, we could have craving, you know, and we do have craving so many times each day, this number eight, number nine is specifically talking about uh, close to the time of death. Okay. So um, close to the time of death, yes, in general, um, you'll see in the text like um, we might, uh, yeah, be on our deathbed and we'll start to feel cold, okay? We'll have a, an aversion uh, to feeling cold, okay? So that is the, the sort of craving. And remember here, uh, we can have a, a craving that is craving to be separated from an unpleasant sensation. Okay, then as that craving goes stronger, then uh, it turns into the grasping. Okay, it's just sort of the, the, the continuation of the craving. And then uh, the, crave, uh, the, the craving combined with the grasping, the grasping is then strong enough to ripen or to activate a previously accumulated karmic imprint. And then that ripened karmic imprint is what we call the existence, or here they say uh, potential existence. Okay. Right. Then we die. And that consciousness, you know, leaves this body. Uh, in some cases, there's the bardo period. But um, just leaving that aside for now, then we have the birth, uh, which again is the that mind entering into uh the the fertilized egg hmm? and then aging and death <clears throat> so when does aging start uh not at age 35 but right the very next moment of the the conscious enters the the, the egg then from second two as that cell splits from one to two that's aging, okay? So we got all that? Yes? Okay. <clears throat> so if you understand that, then, yeah, there's these different ways <clears throat> to sort of, um, yeah, slice it and dice it, as they say, right? But uh, actually, before, before we get into that, let's just then um, uh, just do a little bit different order of these, okay? So the, the other way to sort of think about it is, okay, let's already start in this life where we have uh, ignorance, unfortunately. Due to that, we accumulate karma. Those karmas get uh, deposited on our mental consciousness, okay? And by the way, this is happening over and over and over again every day, okay? So uh, for our perspective from now, right, the, uh, the name and form, six sources, um, you know, uh, contact, feeling, they've already happened, right? Right? Okay. So let's just start with, you know, we have from, from, from today, we have ignorance, uh, compositional activity, and then uh, consciousness, okay? Then we fast forward to the time of our death, and then we have uh, 
the craving, grasping, and existence, right? And then we get projected into our next life. We'll get birth, right? And then aging and death, okay? So, uh, yeah, later we'll get into this, but there's that talk about whether it takes, you know, how many lives for these uh, 12 links to uh, ensue, okay? So the key there, right, whether it takes two or three lives is all depending on the craving and grasping that comes at the time of our death, whether or not it activates a karma, uh, a karmic imprint that we've accumulated in this life or not. So if that karmic imprint that was um, activated uh, was accumulated in this life, then it'll be two lives. If it's not, and the, the karmic imprint uh, that gets activated at our time of death was accumulated in another life, it'll take three lives. Okay. Anyway, uh, we'll talk about that later. But um, for, for now, uh, we're talking in this order that we just have the um, ignorance, compositional activity, and consciousness. Then at the time of death, uh, or right before the time of death, um, craving, grasping, and existence. And then in the, in the next life, there's that whole process in the womb again, from uh, name and form, right, uh, to feeling. But that name and form is simultaneous with uh, birth, okay? So that um, birth and that name and form which are simultaneous, are both the uh, effect of existence. Okay? So you see how, how that's working? All right. So like that. Okay? So then in, in that order, actually, uh, it will go um, like one, two, three, right? Um, ignorance, composition of activity, uh, consciousness, and then it'll skip to 10, okay? Oh, sorry, sorry, eight, right? Eight, craving, grasping, 10 is uh, existence, okay? So then those, those other uh, five to seven, no, four to seven, yikes, uh, those uh, come after existence, okay? All right, <sighs> okay. So if that is now clear, and sorry, I might be ca causing you more confusion. Now we can then talk about these uh, classifications, right? So we touched on this at the end of last session that there are these four categories. Uh, remember, compendium of knowledge um, that's uh, written by Asanga. And so, hmm, maybe this is worth uh, mentioning now because uh, maybe not all of you know, but um, so Asanga, you've heard of, right? Uh, Arya Asanga. Um, so he was a, a very great Indian master and he composed um, many texts. Uh, you, you probably know him from the story of um, him meditating in the cave and uh, at the end of his uh, retreat, uh, you know, he did this 12 year retreat and every three years um, he was about to give up. He leaves his cave. He's about to quit. He sees uh, some uh, example of sort of worldly perseverance. Um, so I think one time he um, saw someone who was um, kind of fi uh, filing down big iron blocks into uh, needles, do you understand? Uh, at another time he saw, uh, when he came out of his cave, he saw someone trying to like erode a mountain that was blocking the, the, the sun. And then at another time he saw the, the very jagged sort of uh, cliff face um, had been worn smooth by the pigeons uh, entering 
in and out, right? Okay. Anyway, then the story of him seeing the dog uh, who is infested with maggots, generated great compassion, uh, then, you know, cut his own flesh to give uh, to the dog and try to remove the maggots with his own tongue as to not injure them. And then uh, the dog sort of transformed into Maitreya. You guys all know the story, right? Okay. So then the, the, the point is Maitreya uh, took him to uh, Tushita, uh, Tushita Pure Land, and uh, gave him the, the five texts, um, the five uh, treatises by Maitreya. And then when um, Asanga came back to earth, he uh, wrote uh, commentaries on those. And he also wrote other uh, sort of treatises. Now, within those five texts, actually, um, three of them are uh, texts that are written according to the mind-only school point of view, okay? Uh, so the five texts, we have the uh, ornament of Mahayana Sutras, we have the ornament of clear realizations, and then we have the, um, oh man, well, uh, Uttara Tantra or Sublime Continuum. And then uh, I'm not sure how they, they translate this. Um, it's like uh, distinguishing the real, distinguishing the real, okay? And um, there's another one, like distinguishing, uh, oh man, <laughs> my memory is failing me. Uh, should I look it up? Uh, anyway, there's a, anyway, there's five texts, okay? Three of them, um, it has namche, yeah? Like, which is like distinguishing. Uh, distinguish, oh, distinguishing the dharmata. That's it, okay? Um, so those three are written by uh, uh, Maitreya according to the mind-only school, okay? So some of uh, Sangha's commentaries, he then followed that he he went on the school was a, a prasangika Madhyamika. okay but uh he wrote uh his his commentaries uh according to these different uh schools now why am i going into all this because this text the compendium of knowledge okay actually uh you know there is the abhidharma uh, kosha written by uh, his half brother vasubandhu which formed the sort of treasury of knowledge according to the, 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 uh, the lower schools or the Hinayana uh, tenant system, okay? And this compendium of knowledge was uh, the Abhidharma for the higher schools, okay? Now, but of the four, right, the, the Abhidharma Kosha basically uh, talked about uh, the, the viewpoints of the, the first two tenant systems and this compendium of knowledge was the sort of shared views of the uh, higher two tenant systems, the mind only school, as well as the mind yamika. Okay. Now within those, there's a lot of disagreement, but there's a sort of um, some shared views that uh, were explained here. And the, the most important kind of shared view that the, the, the Mahayana tenant system have is that they accept both the selflessness of person as well as the selflessness of phenomena. Yeah. Whereas the Hinayana tenant systems, the Vaibhashika and the Satanjika, they only accept the selflessness of person, but they actually believe in the, the self of phenomena. They believe in the, uh, yeah, that actually all phenomena um, other than the person uh, possess uh, a sort of uh, self. Do you understand? Okay. So um, anyway, yeah, that's a little bit about uh, Asanga and this uh, compendium of knowledge. 
it's important because when you look a little bit down in the, the rest of the text, you'll see, uh, you know, Asanga's viewpoint being um, sort of debated against uh, Chandrakirti. But it, it's just important to note that this viewpoint of the compendium of knowledge isn't that of the Prasangika Majamika, although Asanga himself was a Prasangika Majamika. Okay? All right, that's the point. Otherwise, uh, sometimes it can be a bit uh, confusing. Okay. So, anyway, hmm. we have these then, the four categories the projecting factors, projected factors, actualizing factors, and actualized factors. Okay. So, we have the projecting factors that is ignorance, compositional activity, and consciousness. Okay. What do they uh, project? Name and form, six sources, contact, and feeling. Okay. But now, this is the critical thing, according to my deluded mind. Okay. Now, what is the point? Again, I'm a big picture guy. What is the point of uh, going into all these 12 links? It is to uh, generate the mind of renunciation definite emergence, okay? How do we do that? We have to then see the faults of samsara, the drawbacks of, you know, the cycling existence, okay? So then the, the, the question is, right, okay, what then is cycling existence? Then the uncontrolled process of rebirth due to our karma and afflictions, okay? So now, Yes, as I said, that's a very fine kind of working definition, okay? But if one wanted to delve a bit deeper and say, okay, how then it, are karma and affliction propelling this, um, this cycle of existence, then these 12 links give us more detail, okay? So here... You see, we have uh, ignorance, karma, those karmic imprints deposited onto the consciousness, okay? So that's what's doing the uh, projecting, okay? But that in and of itself, you know, that karmic imprint needs to be activated or in this case actualized before it can uh, project another rebirth. So we have the uh, actualizing factors. What is that? Craving, grasping, and existence. Okay? So then, when we have the projected factors, uh, the last one being the karmic imprint, then those want to, okay, project the name and form, uh, six sources, contact, and feeling, but if they don't come into contact with the uh, actualizing factors, it won't. Hmm? You understand? Hmm. So then, after the actualizing factors uh, activate, as it were, the uh, karmic imprint, then birth can uh, occur. And then, remember, we have name and form simultaneous with birth. Okay? So here, it's saying... What are the actualized factors? Birth, aging, and death. Hmm? And what are the projected factors? Name, form, six sources, contact, feeling. Okay. But really, um, those, they all are happening uh, sort of simultaneous, right? Uh, the, the, the birth and the name and form. And then once you're, you're born, you, you know, you, you gradually uh, age and then you die. So that process of aging, uh, you know, means development in the womb, first of all. Then the rest of those six sources, contact and feeling will develop. Okay? All right. All right. So uh, here, I think this is where we, we left off uh, last time. 
well then, what is the point of presenting these two cycles of causality, right? And that, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, because just in and of themselves, the, the, the first three isn't enough to uh, project another rebirth. And actually, uh, those of you, or, or sorry, I don't want to say that actually, because none of us are going to attain mere uh, liberation in this life. We're all going to go on to the Bodhisattva path, right? Okay, but let's just say someone, uh, Joe, who is going to uh, attain uh, just liberation for himself, okay? But right now, uh, you know, he has not, uh, you know, he's not liberated now, but he's going to attain liberation in this life, okay? So he, you know, how he's going to get liberated is uh, right now he has ignorance, but he's going to meditate on selflessness. He's going to abandon the, the view uh, grasping to true existence, okay? So then at the time of death, what's going to happen? Uh, yes, he doesn't have ignorance. He's abandoned that, okay? So good. But the actual mechanism is he won't have craving or grasping, and therefore, those karmic imprints that are stored on the, the mental continuum won't then go to uh, 10, existence, you know? So, therefore, uh, you know, he doesn't take uh, rebirth. There's no birth, there's ne therefore no aging and death. So, in, in that sense, the, where this process of the 12 links is, is, is cut from a practical perspective, right, is you're cutting it at uh, craving grasping. You're cutting it at, at, at craving, okay? Because in that life, you know, you will have had ignorance, okay? You will have had ignorance, even in, in this, this last life before uh, you attain nirvana, um, even right before you sit down for that final meditation, you will have uh, some, some subtle uh, innate ignorance. Mm -hmm. Okay? So by abandoning that uh, ignorance, you actually abandon all of the, the afflictions. Remember, um, this, uh, what was it saying? Hold on. Ah, yes. Here, it says, remember, where there is no ignorance, craving does not occur, even if feelings are present. Okay? So that's what we're trying to do. We abandon ignorance, so actually uh, we abandon craving. So that craving doesn't become grasping, so that grasping doesn't activate a uh, karmic imprint. Okay? All right. Okay. So... Let me get into the text here. So, well, then, what is the point of presenting two cycles of causality? Reply. Such a presentation demonstrates the characteristics of true suffering that are effects of projection uh, differ from those that are effects of actualization. The former, consciousness of the effect period, name, form, six sources, contact, and feeling, are dormant at the time of projection. Okay? What this means, uh, you know, un until they get uh, sort of actualized or activated by craving, grasping existence, you know, they are, are dormant. They're not, they're not uh, manifest, okay? Since they have uh, not actually been established, they'll only become suffering in the future. However, the latter, birth, aging, and death, are situations in which the suffering has been actualized and hence, are suffering in this lifetime. Okay. Now, I, I should say, the birth, aging, and death that we experience in this lifetime are the effects of, you know, the the craving, grasping existence of our previous life. Okay. Mm. 
So uh, moreover, the two cycles of cause and effect were presented for the sake of demonstrating that the effect taking rebirth has two causes, projecting causes and causes that actualize what has been projected. Okay, you're following me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so then the, the level of yogic deeds states the reasons for this. Again, the, the, the level of yogic deeds was written by Asanga. Uh, given that the factor of birth and aging and death and the group of factors beginning with the resultant period of consciousness and ending with feeling uh, our phenomena with shared characteristics. Uh, you understand that? So remember, uh, th this is what we were saying that the, the birth and name and form, you know, it's, it's all kind of shared, right? It's all uh, simultaneous, they go on. So then the question is, why do then do they present it in two ways? So this is done, one, in order to demonstrate the different characteristics of these things that bring suffering, and in order to demonstrate the distinction between projection and actualization. Okay. Uh, among the factors, how many are both included in true sufferings and become sufferings in this lifetime? There are two, birth and aging and death. How many are just included within true sufferings and will only become sufferings in the future? The ones that are in the dormant group of factors beginning with resultant period consciousness and ending with feeling. Okay? Therefore, the two factors of praise, craving, which is an actualizing factor, and feeling, which gives rise to this craving, are not in the same sequence of dependent arising. The feeling that gives rise to craving is an effect of some other sequence of dependent arising. Yes, you understand? Right? Um, so... Yes? Shall I believe you when, when I see you do this? You understand? Okay. I believe you. All right. So uh, projecting and, and uh, being projected should be understood by way of four considerations. What has been projected? The four and a half factors beginning with resultant period consciousness and ending uh, with feeling. They have been projected. Okay? All right. What has done the project projecting? Compositional activity, which is dependent on ignorance, has done the projecting. Okay? So now, this, uh, actually, we should see that compositional activity and ignorance, that actually would be in another lifetime from the uh, four and a half factors, right? Result in period uh, consciousness ending with feeling, okay? That has been projected by uh, the compositional activity and ignorance from another life. How has the projection occurred? Projection has occurred by means of the, the latent karmic propensities being infused in the and causal period consciousness. Okay? You understand? Mm. Projected means having created the effects conducive to the actualization once the actualizers such as craving are present. Okay? So this is what we were saying, right? Although one has those, those three, uh, ignorance, compositional activity, and uh, consciousness, until those are actualized, hmm, then they don't actually have the power in and of themselves to project. Okay. Yes? All right. So then the actualizers and the actualized should be understood by way of three considerations. What does the actual, uh, actualizing? It is done by grasping which is caused by craving. What is actualized? Birth and death, uh, sorry, birth and aging and death are actualized. How does actualization occur? Actualization occurs by means 
of the impairment of the uh, latent karmic propensities that were infused in the consciousness by comp uh, compositional activity. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now, uh, Vasubandhu, uh, Asanga's half brother. So um, he wrote the Abhidhamma Kosha, which was uh, written in, according to the Vaibhashika uh, viewpoint. Um, but later in his life, uh, he actually became uh, a mind only school adherent. Okay. So here in his explanation of the divisions of dependent arising, uh, he took the factor of birth as the only actualized factor and taught the aging and death to be the faults of, the, of these factors of projection and actualization. Okay. So, all right. Uh, yeah, different scholars have different ways of putting it. Um, so there's not so big a difference here. Um, but basically, remember how we were saying that um, name and form and birth is simultaneous, okay? So actually, to, to, to say in the other view, right, that what is actualized is birth, aging, and death, well, uh, in some way, you know, the what is projected, the name and form all the way to feeling, well, that is part of the same stream. So the aging and death is actually part of both, right? That's a fault uh, with just being born, right? But it's also a fault with having uh, name and form, okay? Because name and form is simultaneous with birth. So just as when we say, once you're born, you're going to get older and then die, the same thing could be said with once you've, you've uh, gone into the, the, the link of name and form, you're also going to, uh, you know, get old and die. Or actually, maybe not get old, but yeah, even the next second, actually, you've aged. So even the, the, those beings who die in the mother's womb, they have gone through aging. Okay. You understand? So that's the point of, of Vasubandhu saying like this, teaching the aging and death to be the faults of both the projection and what, what is the projecting factors, uh, ignorance, compositional activity, and uh, consciousness, and actualization, craving, grasping, existence. Okay? All right. So now... Um, Okay, this being the case. So here, mm, it's always sort of, um, hmm, you have to read a little bit critically because um, here, I, I want to look at Tibetan, but uh, this being the case doesn't necessarily mean that uh, Tsongkhapa is agreeing with Vasubandhu's viewpoint, okay? And in fact, um, I think that, see, Tsongkhapa is explaining uh, according to Vasubandhu's viewpoint. So this being the case means like uh, just f following in, in Vasubandhu's train of thought, right, where he uh, talks about the, the, the aging and death to be the, the faults of, of the factors of both projection and actualization, then actualization should be understood as follows. You understand? So many times you'll come across this, uh, especially in Lama Tsongkhapa's work. He'll introduce one uh, you know, Indian scholar or previous master who's taken a position, and then he'll sort of adopt that framework and then explain it a bit more. Okay, So that's what's, what is going on here. So actualization should be understood as follows. Non-virtuous compositional activity, uh, yeah, that is motivated by ignorance about karma and its effects, 
deposits latent propensities of bad karma in the consciousness. This makes ready for actualization the group of factors of a miserable rebirth that, be uh, that begins with the resultant period consciousness and ends with feeling. Through repeated nurturing by craving and grasping, these latent propensities are empowered and birth, aging, and so forth will be actualized in subsequent miserable rebirths. Okay. Alternatively, motivated by ignorance about the meaning of selflessness, meritorious compositional activity, such as ethical discipline within the desire realm or invariable compositional activity, such as the cultivation of meditative serenity within the higher deities realms, deposits, ooh, latent propensity of good karma in the consciousness. This makes ready for the actualization of the group of factors, beginning with the resultant period consciousness and ending with feeling for respectively, a happy rebirth in the desire realm or rebirth as a deity in the higher realms. Through repeated nurturing, by craving and grasping, these latent propensities are empowered and subsequently birth and so forth will be actualized in those happy realms. Okay, so uh, that I think you should know by now, right? Um, we're going to talk a little bit at the end uh, because, again, this thought uh, about ignorance, about karma and effects, that depositing latent propensities of bad karma, okay? We're going to talk about uh, this viewpoint again at the end. But uh, let's just uh, go on here. So the 12 factors, moreover, are subsumed under three paths, uh, those of affliction, karma, and suffering, okay? As the wise Nagarjuna said, the first, eighth, and ninth, so ignorance, craving, grasping, are afflictions, yes. Uh, compositional activity, second, and the tenth, existence, uh, is karma, and the remaining seven are suffering. Okay, now to be uh, very technical, actually all the 12 links are uh, true suffering, okay? But, um, you know, it's just like in, in the Four Noble Truths, right? You have true suffering and uh, true origins. So actually everything that is a true origin is also a true suffering, okay? But when they divide into true sufferings and true origins, then the things that are actually true origins uh, aren't included in the, the, the true sufferings when you divide like that. You understand? So similarly, actually, uh, all 12 links are true suffering. But then when um, uh, Nagarjuna is, is dividing into these three, then, you know, the, the afflictions... Uh, like craving, grasping, and ignorance are, are then included in just that division of afflictions, and they're not included in uh, the sufferings because they don't want uh, double counting, okay? So that's the point. All right, so the Rice Seedling Sutra mentions four causes which subsume the 12 factors of the and arising. It explains that when the seeds of consciousness uh, sown into the field of karma by ignorance are subsequently moistened by the water of craving, they give rise to the sprout of name and form in the mother's womb. Okay, so I think I mentioned last time this Rice Seedling Sutra is the, um, the sort of sutric uh, source of the 12 links. And so, um, anyway, Sankaba just mentions that here. Okay. Hmm. So in interest of time, maybe, maybe we won't go through all the words, right? Um, but let's just explain the number of lifetimes uh, required to complete all 12 factors, right? So uh, first of all, the thing to keep in mind here is, um, yeah, it says here in the first sentence, while it is possible for countless eons to go by between projecting and projected factors, uh, 
It is also possible for the projected factors to be actualized in the very next lifetime with no intervening lifetime. Okay, so th this is what I was saying that, you know, in this life we have ignorance, uh, compositional activity, and uh, consciousness, uh, consciousness of the, the causal period. Okay, so then for it to be actualized in the very next life, okay, this karmic uh, propensity that we've accumulated in this life would need to be activated by uh, craving and grasping at our time of death. Okay. But if it doesn't, then a uh, karmic propensity from another life would then get activated and project another rebirth, okay? So then in life two, what is then activated? Hmm? Well, if it is the uh, karmic propensity that we, we did in this life, right? Then that would have us, uh, you know, three lives because we would have, you know, this life, with the three, uh, and then in the next life, we would have, uh, you know, the, that karmic imprint from this life being activated by uh, craving, grasping, and then that becomes existence. And then in the third life, we have all, all the rest, the you know, name and form to feeling, as well as birth, uh, aging, and death. Okay, so that's three lives. But uh, if uh, in this life, we have, you know, ignorance, compositional activity, and uh, consciousness, okay? If even in the next life, that, that uh, karmic imprint isn't um, ripened by uh, craving and grasping, then it could also not be ripened in the next life after that and after that. And so that's why it's saying uh, it's possible for countless eons to go by between the projecting, right? So these th first three links, and then the projected. You, you understand how many eons could go by? All right. So that's good. And then the, the, the shortest case is two, where at the, the moment of death in this life, then a uh, karmic propensity that we've accumulated in this life would be activated by craving grasping. Hmm? And then it would just be uh, two lives. Okay. So I don't think that that's that difficult. Right. So you understand? Okay. I believe you. Mm. All right, so l let's just do this here, okay? Um, you see this, the, the master Nagarjuna says in his heart of dependent arising, from the three arise the two, from the two arise the seven, and again from the seven arise the three, the wheel of existence itself repeatedly turns. Yes? So, um, you know, we were talking about a good exam question. So a great exam question would be uh, to give this quote and then to have, you know, the students identify, okay, what are the three, what are the two, what are the seven? So without looking, can all of you do that? Huh? Dilshad, wow, I like the confidence. Okay, very good. Uh, okay. All right. So I think that's pretty good. Okay. Uh, there's something here about um, the Geshe Puchungwa. Um, so I'll read this, okay? With regard to this, the great spiritual friend Puchungwa engaged in mental training based solely on the 12 factors of dependent arising and made the stages of the path 
simply a reflection uh, on the progression through and cessation of these factors. That is, he explained that the reflection uh, on the progression through and cessation of the 12 factors of the miserable realms is the teaching for the persons of small capacity. And the reflection on the progression through and cessation of the 12 factors of the two happy realms is the teaching for persons of medium capacity. You understand? So uh, here, th th this, um, yeah, this question came up about how we actually, you know, practice, right? And so, you know, this is one way of, of doing it um, based on the, the, the other kind of scopes in the Lam Rim. So, all right, we have ignorance and then that um, have compositional activity. So, of course, uh, you know, between, between the ignorance and compositional activity, you know, we could have uh, anger or uh, other sort of afflictions. So um, that process, uh, ignorance and um, compositional activity is not meant to be sort of exhaustive, right? But um, this thought that ignorance is the one that pervades all the other afflictions, uh, then that's why they just sort of uh, boil it down to two like that. Ignorance, then compositional activity. Uh, but there could be many other sort of afflictions uh, that are there. All those afflictions would then uh, lead to this compositional activity or karma. Okay? So what Geshe uh, Puchungwa uh, is saying, we have, uh, okay, when we do uh, negative actions motivated by uh, karma, right, and, and other afflictions, that uh, compositional activity is a, a negative karma. And then that gets deposited on the, um, the mental consciousness. Then at the time of death, craving, grasping will then uh, activate that negative karma, which will then uh, project rebirth in the lower realms of existence. Okay. So the small capable being, right, they, their main sort of objective is not to, to get uh, rebirth in the lower realms. And so understanding this process, right, then they develop a wish, okay, I don't want to get rebirth in the lower realms. How is that, um, how is that possible? Okay, I have to uh, get rid of the causes. What are the causes? Okay, this number two, compositional activity, what kind? Compositional activity motivated by the, uh, you know, uh, gross uh, afflictions, hmm? right? Okay. Now, okay. The medium capacity, okay? Uh, reflecting on the progression through and cessation of the 12 factors of the two happy realms, that means uh, humans and devas, right? So it's the same uh, kind of thing where you still have, remember we were talking earlier in the session about uh, someone wanting to have uh, good resources in the next life, but uh, they still uh, have grasping to the self and therefore uh, they collect positive karma, but it's contaminated, right? Contaminated by the, the view of uh, the ignorant view of the self, right? So those people, yes, they have ignorance, but then between the, the ignorance, as it were, and the, the compositional activity, they have this virtuous thought to get a good, uh, you know, experience in their next life. Okay, contaminated by, right? Therefore, uh, they collect contaminated karma. That contaminated karma, then, when it, it is activated by craving and grasping, will uh, lead to rebirth within the high realms of existence, but it's still in samsara. 
Okay. So then seeing, okay, then they take rebirth again in samsara. Oh, they now have, you know, the, the name and form all the way through to feeling. Okay. Then every time there is th these, these feelings, you get, a, you know, attachment to the pleasant, aversion to the unpleasant, and then you're accumulating uh, more uh, karmic seeds all the time, right? So it's endless. And then thinking in this way, uh, wow, they then don't want to uh, get reborn uh, even in the higher realms of existence. And therefore they, you know, uh, generate the mind of renunciation or definite emergence. And then they seek out to uproot the uh, root cause of samsara, the ignorance grasping to the self. Okay. So that, that's then how the, the, the persons of the, uh, you know, middle capacity um, train. Then the teaching for persons of, of uh, great capacity is to assess their own situation according to these two practices. Okay, so remember, that's why we talk about the, the path shared with the, the, the lower capable being, the path shared with the middle capable being. So the, the great capable being or the would-be bodhisattva, right? Then they still do the training according to the, the persons of the middle, middle and uh, small capacities. Then they develop love and compassion for living beings who have been their mothers and have wandered through cycle existence by way of the 12 factors. Uh, train themselves in the wish to become Buddha for the sake of these beings and learn the path of descent. So remember, we were saying uh, before that the wish that is to be free from suffering, the more understanding we have of suffering, uh, then when we relate that to others, the stronger our compassion can be. Okay. All right, so uh, this leads us to four, uh, how their significance is summarized. You should understand well, as, as explained above, how psychic existence, the aggregate of suffering, is formed through the power of its origin, uh, karma and the afflictions, and in particular, how the wheel of uh, existence turns in the context of the 12 factors. Understanding this and becoming familiar with it destroys the unbearable gloom of confusion, the root of all problems. It eradicates all mistaken views, holding external and internal compositional activities to arise causelessly or from incompatible causes. Okay, now here, the, the significant one is, you know, we're talking about cause and effect. Buddhism all the time is talking about cause and effect. But, um, you know, they have the external cause and effect, seeds arising, you know, um, oh, sorry, sprouts arising from seeds and so forth. But then the internal uh, composition activities means here virtue, non-virtue. And those leading to, uh, you know, happiness and suffering, okay? So remember, as His Holiness often says, uh, in his introductions to Buddhism, there's, uh, you know, this thought that all of us, uh, all, all sentient beings want to be happy and don't want to suffer, okay? So if we want happiness and don't want to suffer, we then have to inquire into their respective causes, right? And then the thing that we want, happiness, we need to accumulate the causes. And then the uh, things that we don't want, the suffering, we have to abandon those causes, okay? So, um, you see, uh, the mistaken views about, okay, why am I happy or why do I suffer, okay, there's so many other kind of different views around that would hold that, yeah, there's no internal law of uh, cause and effect, um, and, you know, therefore, I don't have to uh, engage in virtue because, uh, you know, uh, bad, bad people who are committing all sorts of uh, negativities all the time, we see them, uh, you know, enjoying, um, you know, some level of success in this life. 
uh, you know, some even become president. <laughs> so, so, you know, people can then think that, oh, there's no, none of this kind of a law of, of, of karma. Uh, and then when they don't believe the sort of impetus for them to uh, engage in virtuous ac activities is uh, much less. Of course, they could do a few small uh, sort of uh, good things um, from time to time, but even that, uh, you know, maybe th they'll still engage in acts of generosity, but they'll do that, uh, you know, to uh, become famous as a philanthropist or, or something like this. It won't be sort of pure, uh, purely motivated. Okay. Mm. It increases the, the precious wealth, the treasury of the conqueror's teachings, exact knowledge of the characteristics of psychic existence and intense disenchantment with them. It is the best means for achieving, or sorry, activating the latent propensities by which you'll attain the sublime state of a noble being. Uh, thus, the Tantra requested by Subahu uh, says the path of dependent arising destroys ignorance. Okay. Hmm. The Rice Seedling Sutra states that when you understand dependent arising well, you put an end to all bad views that take as their object the beginning, the end, or the present. Master Marijuna said this dependent arising is the profound treasure in the storehouse of the conqueror's speech. All right. So here, um, it's important to note, right? You know, we talked, I think, on the, the first day about these three different levels of dependent arising, right? We have dependent arising due to causes and conditions, dependent arising due to, uh, you know, independence on the parts, and dependent arising um, based on you know mere imputation. Yes. Okay. So mm, you see here uh, in, in in the the paragraph we went just a little bit before, where it's talking about um, in, incompatible causes or arising causelessly. So one of the, the, the main points, uh, and actually uh, it's more important here, the, this cause and effect relationship between our ignorance, our compositional activities, uh, and the, the suffering we experience in samsara, okay? So when we say, um, yeah, the path of dependent arising destroys ignorance, on the one hand, it destroys the ignorance that uh, is confused about what the sources and drivers of our happiness and suffering are, okay? But um, it's my sort of thought that you could also think of, you know, ignorance being the ignorance on the ultimate nature of phenomena. And you know the path of dependent arising, uh, taken in its most subtle view, uh, that everything is is merely labeled by the mind, right? Then the understanding of that destroys the ignorance of the ultimate, uh, you know, nature of reality. Okay, and so uh, therefore, um, yeah, there can be these these two levels of interpretation. My thought is that when Nagarjuna says this dependent arising is the profound treasure in the storehouse of the conqueror's speech, I think he's referring more to the fact that everything is, you know, uh, dependent arising, merely able by the mind. That um, sort of teaching, that pronouncement by the Buddha is the sort of, you know, treasure in all the Buddhist teachings. And we see that also in, you know, Lama Sankaba's praise of uh, dependent origination where you know he praises the the, the buddha for uh, teaching uh, dependent arising as being the uh, you know i think in the second stanza he says you know the uh, all of the the miseries 
you know, ar arise from, uh, you know, ignorance. And you taught this dependent arising to overcome that ignorance. Okay. All right. So last here, we have the, this uh, story of uh, the wheel of life. So basis of discipline, that's a, a text on Vinaya, uh, says it was the custom of the excellent pair, Shaipucha and Mogalayana, uh, occasionally to travel among the five kinds of beings. Uh, after they travel there, they will return to Jambudipa, that means earth, to, and recount the sufferings of these beings to the four types of Buddha's followers. Um, I think I talked about this on the, the very uh, first day also. So the history of how that uh, picture of the wheel of life came about. Okay, uh, some of their followers lived uh, either with or near uh, the same persons who disdained uh, pure conduct. The followers brought them before the excellent pair who instructed them uh, in these accounts of suffering in the other realms. As a result of these instructions, uh, they came to delight in pure conduct and were brought to a higher understanding as well. The teacher seeing this question, Ananda, who informed him of the reasons whereby the Buddha said, because th there will not always be teachers like this excellent pair, make a painting in the gate house of a five part wheel of psychic existence and around the circumference of which are the 12 dependent arisings in both forward and reverse progressions. Uh, the wheel of existence was then drawn. Okay, on another occasion, a Buddha painted a painting of the Buddha was sent to King Udrayana before it was sent. The 12 dependent arisings in forward and reverse progression were written in verse at the bottom. The king memorized this. And then at dawn, sitting with legs crossed and body straight, concentrated his uh, attention upon virtue by focusing up on the two processes of dependent arising. That means the forward and reverse he achieved the sublime state of a noble being. Okay, so, yeah. Um, yeah, that's the chapter from Lamrim Chenmo. Now, um, hmm. okay. Now we were trying to uh, talk about the, you know, three types of wisdom, wisdom arising from hearing, uh, contemplation and meditation, right? So now uh, I'm going to address a bit the, the question about how we put this into practice. So now you've all uh, developed some of the wisdom arising from hearing, I hope. And uh, now it's up to you to do the contemplation. And so, um, my, uh, yeah, maybe suggestion is that, you know, you are able to go through the, the 12 links. You're able to, uh, you know, yourself uh, categorize them into these various factors. You're able to, you know, uh, talk about how, you know, from the three come to two, come to seven, all those kinds of things, right? And you can also do it in for forward and reverse order, right? So we've we've talked we've spoken only explicitly about the the forward order. Um, oh, maybe once we talked about the reverse order. So that would be right. Remember, we, we said on the very first day that uh, now that you've attained this precious human rebirth, use it to uh, uh, strive to end re rebirth. Right. So, hmm, seeing that from birth comes all the other sufferings. So if we don't want all the other sufferings, we have to get rid of birth. If we don't want birth, we have to get rid of uh, existence. If we don't want existence, we have to get rid of craving. Sorry, grasping. If we don't want grasping, we have to get rid of craving. You know? And then, so the, re the reverse way is like how you uh, stop the, this uh, wheel of existence. Okay? You know? So thinking about just like this, this king did, thinking about in the forward and reverse order. Okay, fine. Hmm. Now, uh, I touched on this before, but you see, 
uh, there's two things that I think are, are even more critical. Remembering the big picture. The big picture is, you know, this is in the middle scope. We're trying to develop the mind of renunciation. Okay. So, of course, as it says here, uh, just to get a little bit uh, more detailed view of, you know, instead of saying, okay, I want freedom from samsara. Oh, what is samsara? Karma and afflictions. You know, we can then really dive into it and see this process. Okay. So then seeing that can develop a little bit uh, stronger renunciation. But even more so, you see, of all the faults of um, psychic existence, uh, my impression, my small experience I've had in meditation, you know, of all the, the, the six types of suffering, the eight types of suffering and so forth, what comes very strongly to develop this mind of renunciation is to meditate on the, the endless nature of samsara. Right? Isn't that so sickening? You know, uh, you know, as Narvajuna talks about all the, the bones from our skeletons when we've, uh, you know, taken rebirth since beginning with samsara, it, it would make a mountain higher than Mount Meru. But if we're not liberated, as long as we're not liberated, the amount of, uh, you know, rebirths will be even more than that. Oh. You know, does that affect any of you? It should. Okay. So how does that happen? It's because you see, even in one birth like this, as long as we have not abandoned ignorance, then that th those first three, ignorance, composition, activity, consciousness, ignorance, composition, activity, consciousness, we're doing that so many times in a day right, that we're accumulating all of these uh, karmic imprints that are then deposited on our consciousness, you know, and as they're saying, oh, there could be many eons that go by uh, between uh, now and when that karmic uh, imprint is ripened, right, that should actually be um, a bit terrifying, you know, that uh, we have all these karmic seeds and well, they don't go away by itself. You know, we can, we can uh, combine this with, with those uh, features of karma, right? That, uh, you know, karma is definite, um, karma increases. We don't experience something that we haven't accumulated the karmic uh, cause for and a karma once accumulated does not perish on its own, right? So you then, you know, combine that a little bit and then you think, oh, Wow, even today, um, yes, we, we, we like to think, okay, I'm just in one kind of, you know, karmic, one of the, the, the 12 links here, but actually every day we're creating, uh, we're going, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and accumulating so much more uh, karmic imprints on our mental continuum that will have us <clears throat> take rebirth within samsara. When we think about karma, and then there's the, the effects of, of karma. Remember, we have the, the ripening effect, which is, let's say, for example, in, from a negative karma, we get reborn in the lower realms. Okay, But then even after, after we're out of the lower realms, we have the uh, environmental effects. And then we have the, uh, the uh, what is it called? The ripening effect uh, in concordance with the cause in terms of experience, which is, for example, when if we were to kill, we have a short life. But then there's the uh, uh, ripening effect uh, concordant with uh, action, okay? Which means uh, if we kill in our previous life, then in this life, we'll have a propensity uh, a likening, you know, will like to kill. You understand? So when, when Lamazov Rinpoche, when he talks about uh, 
the, these factors of karma, he says, actually, the, the worst one is, is that last one, that when we have uh, habituated ourselves to certain karmic actions, uh, especially negative ones, uh, you know, in the future, we'll be more uh, sort of predisposed to commit those same actions again. And in that way, uh, you know, our samsara becomes endless. Hmm? Hmm. So now the job is, is for us, right? Yes, we have to meditate. Uh, like Lama Tsongkhapa says in the three principles of the path, okay? The, when, when he defines what it means to actually have that mind of renunciation, he says, um, uh, when even for uh, an instant, you know, you don't have any sort of uh, uh, attraction to the marvels of psycho existence, and day and night, the uh, wish, wishing to be, you know, free from samsara uh, arises continually, uh, then you will have achieved the mind of renunciation. Hmm? Right? You guys know? The, that, that uh, three principles of the path, right? Hmm. So that's the one we have to work on, okay? To have that feeling that, you know, even for a second, we're not uh, attracted by the marvels of psychic existence and day and night having to, uh, you know, to, to think, oh, I must, I must get uh, liberation. I must get liberation. Hmm? So then... Before we have that, okay, it's like, well, we need to apply the antidotes throughout our daily lives, right? And so, um, okay, forget about um, the middle scope. Even before, uh, you know, not having attraction to the marvels of psychic existence, um, most of the time we actually have attraction to the good things of this life you understand so as much as we can uh you know to practice uh contentment you know to practice um you know yeah being being satisfied with what we have and not always wanting to uh, accumulate more right that is something we can do and um also when we, mm, hmm. Lama Zobrimashe talks about the, the sort of daily mindfulness, right? And so, you know, when we talk about mindfulness in some contexts, we talk about like mindfulness of the breath, but he is, you know, is emphasizing, you know, mindfulness of death, mindfulness of all sinning beings have been our mother, and mindfulness of, uh, you know, um, the view of emptiness. So seeing how the root of samsara is this ignorance grasping to the self, as much as we can in our daily life, uh, practice mindfulness of, you know, things being dreamlike, things being illusion-like, things, uh, you know, not existing in the way they appear, um, then that is just slightly cracking or, you know, applying an antidote to the ignorance that is the root of samsara. You understand? And so that's uh, also what we have to do. It's not that we see these 12 links as being like some other uh, topic somehow uh, divorced from the rest of the topics in the Lam Rim. And this is what Geshe uh, Puchungwa was saying. We can, we can apply this 12-link uh, framework to the, the small scope, to the middle scope, and even to the great scope, right? And, um, but the essence, whether you're doing this from the, the standpoint of the 12 links or even the more simple uh, way uh, of the mm, uh, Four Noble Truths, is to one, understand the, the process of samsara so that we develop an antidote 
to the mind that wants good effects within samsara, right? And then uh, two, uh, seeing and understanding in a more detailed way the, the actual root causes of samsara to then um, try to apply uh, you know, reasoning analysis to uproot uh, the, the grasping to the self, which is the, the, the ultimate root of samsara. You understand? So that's our job. That's how we can put it into practice. And um, I wasn't able to get to the, uh, the text, the, 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 the short little summary that I wrote. It's okay. Um, you can read it. And uh, if you don't you have patience, you'll understand a bit later. I was basically, I was talking about the, the homework question that I gave you last time when we were talking about those two types of ignorance, ignorance about cause and effect and ignorance about, uh, you know, the view of ultimate reality and uh, which of those two actually is the root of samsara. So uh, anyway, yeah, it was your homework, but I, I did it uh, also. Okay, uh, so maybe we have time for questions. Shanti, please go ahead. Thank you, Venerable, and of course, uh, the center and all. Uh, I had a question <sighs> regarding um, uh, the, the discrimination at the time of contact uh, is caused by karma. Is it also caused by karma that it's unpleasant, pleasant, or neutral, the object? Uh, or is it only at the time of feeling that uh, karma ripens? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, can you repeat that? Yes, there's a, a, the, a, the link of contact which uh, uh, yeah. show, thinks that something is pleasant or unpleasant, could that also be triggered by ka a karmic imprints? Seeing something as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Well, okay. Um, you see, what contact means is, you know, the, the, the object coming into contact with your consciousness, right? But when that happens, there is the, the feeling, okay? And the, the, the feeling is pleasant, unpleasant, uh, neutral. Huh? Well, is that? No, because right? the text, it says that it, at the time of contact, you discriminate something as unpleasant, pleasant, or neutral. Right. No, no. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Oh, I see. Right, right, right. You have the discrimination of attractive, unattractive, and neutral. And those then, you know, give rise to uh, pleasant, painful, and neutral. Yeah. So the okay. seeing something so, as sorry, seeing something as attractive and unattractive could also be due to karma and not just the reaction to that. At the time of contact. Uh, okay. Sorry. At the time of contact, then. You discriminate something as attractive, unattractive, or neutral. And that is still at the okay. link of contact. So could that be due to your karmic imprints? Okay, so yes, now I understand the question. Yes, yeah. Because this but is you see, don't, don't, don't think they're like, you know, they're, they're happening like uh, almost simultaneously. 
you know, contact and feeling, it, it's like pro probably like that quick, you know? So of course the, um, yeah, anyway. I'm sorry, what, what's, the, what, what, what's the doubt? I'm not getting the, the upshot. No, because it says in the link of feeling that you get a, a, a pleasant, unpleasant feeling based on karma, some past karma. Right. But it can also be while you're discriminating something to exaggerate its qualities that karma comes in, right? That's just the doubt. I guess it both places it plays a role. Okay. All right. Yes, uh, I see Andrea's hand is up. So uh, I have some questions, but I will ask just one question, and it is about aging. Okay. We are talking about, about aging, so in not in this context, but usually aging. We are talking about aging of the body, no? That's why we are kind of kind of young and when you are 30 then you are aging i think but when we are talking here about aging and death what aging is talking about because okay not the body not the mind is not aging i think you know a little bit i don't really understand now what is age you know the meaning uh, uh, your your birth your 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 consciousness is in the egg and this aging is starting but what is aging you know a very stupid question, but okay, not the body, no, no. not the mind, then so, but yeah. is aging. Or... So, you know, th this is just, um, you know, related to impermanence, right? So, you know, every, every moment, uh, you know, the cause disintegrates and it turns into the next moment, right? Right? So this is what I was saying the when when the when the egg you know splits from two to four there's already already aging so aging is just a, a, a way of uh you know like time is passing for a sentient being and each moment that goes by one gets closer to death okay so time right? is passing so maybe, that's maybe that's a good ah that, that maybe that's a maybe that's a good a good way of, of thinking about it. Aging means getting closer to death. Okay. Okay then. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so so even even the not, not getting gray hairs or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so even even when that that cell right the fertilized egg uh, you know splits from two cells to four cells is getting closer to death. It is aged. You know? I mean, hey, even even from like you know babies, right? You're you're one year old. Okay, you get older when you're you're two, right? From one to two, you've gotten older. You've aged. Yes, but it is. Um, yeah, yes, you have aged. But yeah, this is just a kind of uh, expression. Then you are closer to that. Yeah, this is good because the as I said the consciousness and the it's not aging the body is i don't know maybe it is aging then but it's okay thank you yeah okay thank you i mean of course when when you when you look in the the eight types of suffering and they talk about the suffering of aging okay well uh it's talking about uh you know getting gray hair and you know having uh pain and you know uh, all these things that we normally asso associate with old age, right? But, you know, the, and, and that's, you know, when you, when you talk about uh, in, in con common parlance, you know, aging means getting old, like, and old means, mm. yeah, I don't know. Yeah, gray hairs and whatnot. <clears throat> okay, uh, next question. <clears throat> Alexander. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, Venbul Namjan, for, for your teaching, especially for liberating for questions that I asked last time too. 
Yeah, and I have two questions. One question is about that you talk about mind only school when they uh, assert that they, there is eight uh, consciousness. And um, in this case, when the, when the person is faint, uh, uh, what, uh, what Prasanghika said about this? How they like uh, not accept that the person had eight consciousness? And the second question is about um, like uh, we talk about in uh, in uh, twelve links only uh, that um, uh, there is a causes for us to experience suffering and and have the rebirth in the next life, but actually what's what makes our our kind of um, uh, karma to experience in this life? What makes these distinctions to uh, uh, actions that we done now? experience exactly in the, in the, maybe right in this same like uh, after one minute that we just uh, you know just done it or some causes they kind of stored and will be experienced further like for give rise to another rebirth how uh, what makes it a uh, yeah, distinction for this uh, karma to ripen right away or ripen further right okay so uh, the first question might not be satisfying, but the person you could just say that, uh, you know, the, the sixth consciousness, it, uh, you know, when we swoon, it's not that the, the continuity is interrupted. It just is, you know, in a very sort of uh, subtle, um, almost like dormant kind of a mode. Right. So just like, for example, our, um, you know, uh, when we go to sleep, uh, deep dreamless sleep, we don't have any sort of conscious awareness, but, um, uh, you know, that, that consciousness is uh, operating on a very, uh, you know, subtle, uh, subtle level. Right. Mm. So, um, yeah. Basically, they, they don't accept the, the view of the, the, the mind-only school who say that at that time, there is no mental consciousness, right? At the time of fainting, there's no mental consciousness. They say there is a mental consciousness. It's just very subtle. So, you know, we're not aware of it, but it exists. Mm -hmm. Now, your second question as to... Uh, what would cause certain actions to be um, experienced in this life or future lives? Was that the, the thrust of it? Kind of, yeah. Kind of. Well, you know, um, in general, uh, most of what we experience in this life isn't the, the ripening of karmic uh, deeds done in this life. Uh, there are some uh, examples of, um, you know, when there's a particularly powerful object, like our gurus or our parents, uh, then the, those actions become uh, strong enough that they can ripen. Um, in general, uh, what Vasubandhu says in the Abhidharma is... Um, what determines the kind of order uh, of the, the ripening of actions is the, the, the strongest ones get, get ripened first. Yeah. Um, if they're equal in their strength, then the, the older ones will ripen first. Okay. But um, there, Vasubandhu was talking more like at the time of death. But in our kind of daily life, well, there's so many uh, different causes and conditions that happen. Um, it's, it's very, very uh, hard to say why we would experience, um, you know, one thing or another on, on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. You'll have to ask uh, the Buddha. I mean, that, that's in the realm of extremely hidden phenomena, right? Sorry, I'm I'm not even sure. Was that kind of approaching I mean, what yeah, you wanted it's, it's answered? 
it's it's a complex question so i i guess yeah it's it's good thank you Talia. one question please okay so trying to get out of um samsara so that we don't have uncontrollable rebirth let's say that we have up no, let's say someone that who has uprooted the uh, uh grasping to self and realizing emptiness at the same time purify all negative karmas and given that consciousness is beginning less yes uh, where does that consciousness go after the there's no first one and there's no second one yeah so and, um, and sorry and then related to that do bodhisattvas can they be born in samsara? I guess they could be, right? Okay. So, um, ah. now the, the, the first thing, uh, you're talking about uh, just someone who is uh, merely liberated, not a Buddha, right? Uh, you're talking about a Shravaka Arhat? No, I'm talking about someone who is near nearly realizing buddhahood oh, okay right if they okay. are they 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 have wisdom uh, um, realizing emptiness they also have uh. purify all the negative karmas so there's no link one no link two but well but but the, these these arhats also don't have link one and two anymore uh, okay right so okay look the in order to achieve uh, even nirvana, mm. they've abandoned all the 12 links uh, of dependent origination. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it seems, it seems a bit uh, strange to say, but, um, you know, it, it's not that then they don't have feeling anymore or contact, but those are, are, you know, no longer, um, you know, they've, they've abandoned samsara. So uh, at the time of death, they don't have um, craving, grasping existence, but that consciousness will go on, um, you know, and not uh, go into name form um, in samsara, right? So, uh, sorry, I'm going to jump to your second question. See, samsara is not a place, right? So bodhisattvas, Arya bodhisattvas don't get born in samsara, okay. right? Technically speaking, because what is samsara? The process of uncontrolled rebirth due to karma and afflictions. They're not being born in an uncontrolled way due to their karma and afflictions. They're getting born Arya bodhisattvas in a controlled way due to their uh, uncontaminated karma and their pure prayers. Okay, the power of their bodhicitta. Hmm? You understand? So uh, in a similar way, then when we talk about sometimes you also see that uh, they could be reborn in, in a pure land or where they're born inside a lotus that stays uh, closed like this and they're kind of in the middle of a lotus and they stay there for a long time so you'll you'll see um, both kind of presentations now for the buddha right where where do they go <laughs> then um hmm well you see they've achieved the dharmakaya Right, and it says that actually the Dharmakaya or the, the omniscient mind of the Buddha pervades all phenomena. So, at that point, where do they go? They go everywhere, they're all pervading. Okay, now with that all pervading Dharmakaya, they can then manifest um, form bodies according to the needs uh, and, and karma of sending beings, and that could be anywhere. So they'll, 
they, they'll, they'll be everywhere, quite literally, um, but they'll appear in forms that we can see uh, when our karma is, is, is right. You know, like it says in the King of Prayers, on every atom are Buddhas, numberless is uh, Buddhas, you know? No, numberless is atoms, each is a, a host of bodhisattvas, right? So it's kind of like that. Like, yes, I'm confident the sphere of all phenomena is entirely filled with Buddhas in this way. We can't see now. But, um, you know, an Arya Bodhisattva could see, like, tremendous amount of Buddhas on every sort of atom in this room. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. But no, no, but wait a minute. Mm -hmm. You don't want to get born inside that mm -hmm. lotus. It'll take a very, very, very long time for that lotus to open. As long as that lotus isn't open, then all these countless sentient beings are still suffering in samsara. So don't go to, you know, you can be like Guru Rinpoche and be born on an open lotus and then, you know, go out and... Uh, benefits any beings that's okay yeah otherwise it's like those uh you know it, it's quite like those uh, sensory deprivation pods you know you know those <laughs> right you're like you're like sealed up right you can't uh, interact with the outside world you're just like there, vegging out. Uh, that's it. So thank you very much uh, to Laksam Tibetan Meditation uh, Zurich, uh, to Talia and all the rest of the volunteers. Thank you for uh, all of you who uh, showed up, uh, no matter what kind of time zone you're in. So um, thank you very much. And um, yeah, practice well, study well, meditate on bodhicitta. And uh, yeah, um, maybe we can uh, arrange something in the future, up to you. And um, let's just uh, uh, now dedicate. So, um, yeah, due to the merit that we've accumulated our time here uh, together, as well as all the merit accumulated in three times by the number of the sinning beings and numberless Buddhas, uh, may this mind of bodhicitta that has not yet arisen arise in our hearts and in the minds of all sinning beings without even a second's delay. And may that altruistic wish that has already been generated increase. We also dedicate all these merits for the long lives of the spiritual friends, particularly His Holiness Dalai Lama and Lama Zoba Rinpoche. Uh, may they have long and stable lives and may all their holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. We also dedicate uh, all these merits uh, for mm, all the, the problems uh, facing this world, all the problems due to epidemic diseases, um, climate change, environmental problems, natural disasters, uh, war, uh, civil unrest, economic problems. Uh, may all these things uh, be instantly pacified in this and all the other worlds of the 10 directions from now until the end of samsara. Uh, and may all beings uh, have only the most conducive conditions for uh, continuing their Dharma practice, including having all the, the uh, access to the teachers and the teachings. Um, and may they be able to, you know, fulfill uh, all the instructions uh, of their teachers uh, without mistake. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, let's also dedicate for, um, yeah, seal with emptiness. So then due to the merits accumulated over three times by ourselves, as well as the numbers of Buddhas and number of sending beings, May the eye, which exists as a mere imputated, uh, imp imputation of the mind, uh, 
yeah, quickly attain the state of enlightenment, which is merely imputed by the mind, and therefore, thereby, may I lead all sinning beings who are merely imputed by the mind uh, to that state as quickly as possible, and by myself alone. Oh yes, and let's also dedicate for uh, Laksam uh, Center, Tibetan uh, yeah, Center. Um, may it be a very uh, amazing uh, source of uh, Dharma knowledge and learning, and may all of its uh, projects to benefit the teachings of Buddha as well as sending beings, um, you know, come to fruition without obstacle and uh, with great ease. And um, yeah, all the centers, uh, all the centers, volunteers, and uh, you know, benefactors, and everyone who comes to the center uh, to meditate or participate in the, the programs, uh, all those who who tune into the YouTube channel <laughs> and so forth. Uh, may anyone who has even uh, slight contact with the center and never again be reborn in lower realms, and quickly attain all the realizations of the path particularly bodhicitta and the realization of emptiness all the way, including uh, enlightenment. Okay. So, merci beaucoup. Uh, Dr. Shen. So, um, yeah, maybe I just, on behalf of everyone here and in the past sessions, uh, not here as well, um, to thank Venerable Namjong for your efforts and so much preparation so to convey the meanings of this great um, um, great text um, from Amazon Kappa and also all these wonderful teachings so and yeah thank you very much for answering our calls for help and <laughs> and hopefully in the future we'll soon see you either in Zurich or we go to your retreat in India Root Institute or Bangalore <laughs> or Kopan or Dushita. So may our connections be deepened. Um, also, uh, yeah, just thank you so much for your time. And uh, thank you everyone for participating. And uh, I think we have special comic connections to be in the same group and or in a bigger network. So thank you very much, Venerable Namjong. Thank you very much for staying up so late for us. I, I don't even know what time is it. <laughs> one one a.m. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wow.